Hi, uh, welcome to the speech panel. This presentation is called MSA, Speech, Language, and Swallowing Aspects. I'm Jennifer Kalenny, and I'm Becca Wallace. We're gonna start by discussing our personal experience. Um, our father was diagnosed with the cerebellar form of multiple system atrophy in 1994, and he passed away in 1996 at the age of 48. At this time, therapies were not widely used, and MSA was considered a terminal diagnosis. So he was placed on hospice shortly after the diagnosis, and he was on hospice for over a year, which is a very long time to be on hospice. Um, although this disease presents differently patient to patient, there's significant evidence that therapies can help improve quality of life and can help maintain functioning. So in this, at this time, it's definitely something that's recommended. Um, we're gonna talk primarily about speech and swallowing. So from our dad's experience, um, he had a tracheostomy, he had difficulty communicating, particularly with voice and articulation. Um, so that's, that's where we're familiar with and what we look back on when we think about our difficult experience of growing up with um, our dad being sick. Um, and this has led us into our careers, and we're excited to work with a variety of diagnoses, including, including MSA and similar to MSA, so that we can help people with these difficulties as well. Um, in addition, so now we're gonna introduce ourselves. I'm Jenny. Um, I work in a neurological outpatient setting at the Recovery Project in Livonia, Michigan. I'm a certified brain injury specialist, a certified vital stem therapy prov provider. I am LSVT loud certified and speak out certified. And we will discuss these certifications a little bit in depth so you can um, understand if you or a loved one or a patient would benefit from these. My name is Becca and I work as a care coordinator. Um, and basically what I do is assist um, with the smoothness and the safety of transitions for patients from the hospital to the rehab setting to uh, back home or whatever their next home environment may be. Uh, I have a similar background as Jenny in terms of experience with similar types of patients. I'm a certified brain injury specialist. I'm also LSVT loud certified. Um, and I have a background and specific interest in working with patients with tracheostomies and assisting in weaning patients um, from ventilators. So we're gonna to talk today a little bit about the process of assisting patients with MSA and similar neurological disorders um, with their speech, language, and swallowing deficits. The first step um, is to do an evaluation. Uh, and the, the, first, the first thing that we wanna do is get a, get a referral from a physician, um, and then we build a rapport, which for us um, is typically an easy experience because of our personal situation with our father. We build a relationship and really try and support the patient from the very beginning. Um, we'll do an informal interview or an assessment, which involves evaluating skills that are often affected uh, for people with MSA. And sometimes we'll bring in some standardized assessments and some screening tools. You can see there, there's a list of some examples of assessments. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them right now, but the FEES, F-E-E-S, and the MBSS are for evaluating swallowing. Um, and they are um, standardized assessments that we'll talk a little bit about later. After we do an evaluation, the next thing we do is look at the outcome of that evaluation and determine what areas need to be worked on for the patient. Uh, so those areas are typically our therapy targets or the goal areas that we'll work on. Um, with patients with MSA, we often see or may see issues with speech intelligibility or pronunciation, language, voice skills, um, and we'll often uh, evaluate and recommend augmentative alternative communication devices or tools. Um, we see people with dysphagia or swallowing difficulties and deficits in cognition. We're gonna go a little bit more into these areas now. 
So the first area is speech intelligibility. Um, most patients um, are familiar with the term slurring or drunken speech. Um, this is usually diagnosed from a speech or medical standpoint um, term dysarthria, which um, affects the movement of the muscles for speech production. Um, as speech language pathologists, we'll help patients to better speak clearly by giving them strategies and techniques um, to better speak clearly. And we have some examples of those on the next page. But if you can see here in red that the best exercise is to continue using your speech production for functional communication. It's really important to know that as we get further into this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about augmentative alternative communication and how um, this can be helpful in helping a patient who's unable to speak um, to communicate. However, it's always important if you're able to speak to continue using um, your speech and your vocal ability because just like anything else, you have to remember use it or lose it. So try to supplement in different ways when you're working on communication. Um, so we have some examples here of speech intelligibility strategies. Um, these are just a few. Um, and your speech, your speech pathologist may recommend some of them, some may be appropriate for you, so it really just depends on the patient. But using an open mouth posture really helps with volume, it decreases your speech rate, it helps you over articulate, and all of these help a patient to be more clear and helps them to be understood by others. Also, we might recommend a pacing board, which essentially slows the patient down when they're speaking. You can see an example here with circles. Um, and we basically teach the patient to tap the circle or picture the circle so that they're saying one word at a time so it's easily understood. So for example, this says, I went to the store. We teach the patient to start to talk like, I went to the store, to pace, to slow down, to make it easily understood. Um, also, we teach and we train people on deep inhalation or diaphragmatic breathing this helps with increasing volume. Um, it helps with um, increasing the pressure in the lungs by making them expand, which helps with pressure buildup, which is important for speech. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. Also, we'll teach people to alter the message if, if needed. So you might work on a yes, no system. You might teach the person to give a keyword. It really decreases the need for the burden for the speaker if the speaker is able to just give the keyword without all the details using shorter phrases. Again, these are all um, things that can help with uh, the communication partner to be um, able to comprehend what the patient is saying. Um, and again, at the bottom, you can see here that the best exercise is to continue using your speech. You really want to keep using your abilities as long as you're able to because it will help with maintaining your strength. The next area of communication that we work with individuals on is language skills. So with language, we don't see it, we don't necessarily see it in people who have MSA, but it may be a decline that arises towards the end um, or anywhere throughout. So um, we'll touch on it sort of quickly here, but basically expressive language is the way that we communicate wants, needs, ideas to others, and that can be in the verbal or the written form. Uh, receptive language is understanding information. So that could be through reading comprehension, auditory comprehension, sometimes just picking up on cues, facial expressions from other people. Pragmatic language is social language skills. So it's what, it's what we say, how we say it. Uh, Nonverbal communication is also included in this, in this um, area. A lot of times we'll, we'll get some patients together in groups and try and work on social language skills. Uh, and we'll also do one-on-one -on -one training to try and improve um, someone's ability to understand how they're presenting themselves to others, uh, which is really important for communication. The last one is very important, especially for people with MSA. It's nonverbal communication. So facial expressions, eye contact, affect, which is um, uh, exaggeration of speech and inflection, all of those things, including body language, are really important for people who have difficulty communicating verbally. Uh, and these can really add to whatever form of communication they're, they're using and at whatever form is best for them to communicate. 
The next area is uh, an, an area that's very affected for people with MSA, or I should say often affected uh, at some point during their, their um, journey with MSA. The, the first area of voice is vocal quality. Vocal quality is basically the variation of someone's voice. So a lot of times with MSA, we'll, pe we'll see people have a, what we call a strangled or strained or raspy voice. So there's some techniques that we can use to work on that. Intensity is loudness. So a lot of times when people have decreased uh, breath support, or as Jenny was talking about, decreased um, ability to have that pressure that we need to really um, express what we want to say. Uh, there's some exercises and programs that specifically address that. Prosody is intonation and inflection. Um, so we can work with people on that in order to help them understand where their deficits are. LSVT Loud and Speak Out Therapy um, are evidence-based programs for improving volume. That's the main basic area that uh, they address. So it's really focused on people with MSA, Parkinsonian disorders. It's been, there's a lot of research now that it's helping people with cerebral palsy. They're really great programs. Um, so if you have MSA, I highly recommend that you get in contact with your doctor to get a referral for speech. Um, we always say before you're noticing a significant decline, try and address it early. Um, we're not, we don't really wanna try and work on recovering someone, we wanna work on maintaining their skills. So. Um, that's something really important. We also use voice recording and video feedback to increase someone's awareness. So if you can imagine, um, you know, as, as the disease might progress, you might have some issues with voice and your voice might get quieter and you might not realize it and people are saying to you, I can't hear you, can you speak up? And you're, you're thinking to yourself, I'm talking really loud. Well, that's understandable. Um, something that we can do is video record you or voice record you and play that back so that you have more of an awareness of the need to speak louder so others can understand you and you can um, have social interactions and express your wants and needs more easily. Vocal hygiene is taking care of your voice and staying hydrated. It's not yelling, um, not overusing your voice and speaking at an optimal pitch and volume so that you take care of your vocal cords and your vocal mechanisms so that you can use it for as long as possible. And um, the disorders that we usually see that are associated with voice deficits are Parkinson's, uh, muscular dystrophy, MSA. Uh, people with TBIs often have vocal issues. And then also if you go in to get a surgery and you're intubated, a lot of times you might lose your voice or have um, vocal cord paralysis. We work with people with those issues as well. So now we'll talk a little bit about augmentative alternative communication, uh, most commonly known as AAC. We're going to start with low tech devices and discuss those and then we're going to go a little bit into the higher tech. We also have some videos to show you. Um, as we've been discussing, unfortunately, as the MSA progresses, often people lose their ability to speak. So these are alternative methods for communication. Um, we'll discuss a few of these here. It's not limited to these. There's definitely more. And the speech language pathologist will recommend what is most appropriate for you. Um, there's um, communication boards, use of pictures. We're going to have some examples of these on the next slide. There's alphabet boards, which are sim similar to communication board, but it's more like letters. Uh, there's a speak book, which we'll show you a video on in just a few minutes. Also, people can use writing and drawing, and I'll show you an example of a boogie board, and just pen and paper sometimes, just that simple method is really what is best for a family. Uh, also, signing, gestures, blinking, pointing. I had a patient that his only ability was, was to use his toes, so we worked on raising his toes for yes, putting them down for no, um, and really using that method was most effective and he was able to indicate his wants and needs, which was really all that was important. So that's a great way to, you know, make it work. So here we have an example of a speak book. We're going to show you a video. This is a low tech option. This is a speak book. It's a simple communication device for people who can't talk or use their hands. Patrick here designed it. Patrick realised that there was a real need for a cheap, low-tech speech tool that could be used in situations where a high-tech one couldn't or wasn't available at all. 
Here's how it works. You sit about three feet apart and hold the book up between you so you can see each other's eyes through the hole in the middle. Then you look at the phrase you want to say, followed by the circle the same colour as the stripe your phrase is written on. Patrick is looking at this corner, followed by the blue circle. He must mean to say, hello David. Hello Patrick. Speakbook is laminated, so you can write on it using a non-permanent whiteboard marker. When you first get a Speakbook, most of the pages are blank. You fill them in to build up a set of easily accessible phrases which are tailored to your own needs. If you make a mistake or change your mind, just wipe it off with a damp cloth. Down the edge of the book are a series of tabs. When you get the book, most of these are blank. Apart from the one that says home and the one that says spell, you always start on the home page. We filled this one in to show you how to use it. Patrick is looking top right followed by pink. Tell them what the home page is for. OK. Speakbook has eight blank pages, a spell page and a home page. The idea is that you write the seven phrases you use the most on the home page, as it's the page that you always start on. Also, on eight of the coloured strips, you write words that act as links to the other blank double pages. On this one, those are the ones we've written in capital letters. These should be the parts of your life that require a more in-depth set of phrases most often. Each page has room for 14 different phrases. Here's how that works in practice. Home page. Bottom left, blue. Drinks. So I turn to the drinks page. Patrick has chosen this corner, yellow, so pineapple juice. This corner, blue, so with a straw. And this corner, pink, and an umbrella. Every speak book has a spell page which allows you to spell out words and phrases that don't appear elsewhere in the book. There are full instructions inside the front cover. Easy really. If you want to find out where to get your own copy or find out about other versions that are available go to speakbook.org <laughs>
programmed and installed on these devices for ease of um, development. And um, the, the SLP might recommend this during an evaluation. Uh, they might pull in some other individuals like a supplier, uh, someone from Toby Dynavox or Smartbox. There's different suppliers that usually will recommend these and assist with um, finding the right device for the patient. So usually we need to just make sure that the patient is on board to really have a lot of training to use these devices um, and interest in learning to use a, a state-of-the-art device like this. The SLP will also need to develop a letter of medical necessity and get a order from a physician um, to get this hopefully paid for by insurance. Sometimes um, it might be private pay, but hopefully, um, their insurance will pay for it because they can be extremely expensive. Individuals with MSA will often use one of these devices because a lot of times their cognition is not affected at all. We also see patients with Parkinson's, ALS, and a multitude of other diseases um, that will benefit from these devices depending on the severity and uh, the progression of the disease. Here you can see um, a few pictures of these devices. Um, there's a Dynavox on here, a smart box. There's an iPad with uh, an app pulled up on the bottom left that's called Proliquo to Go, um, which is a high tech um, AAC app. You can see how these would be beneficial to someone who is very high level and they have a wider range of um, complex ideals, ideas that they wanna communicate. Um, and it's, you're able to do that with this option, whereas you wouldn't be able to as easily with a alphabet board or um, a, a more simple communication book that Jenny was just talking about. So now we have a video of the, one of the Toby Dynavox devices. I have been coaching kids for over 27 years, and I believe my purpose here on Earth is to help and inspire others. My device allows me to bark orders to the kids. People are amazed by my device and how I control it with my eyes. It is ultimately the only way I can communicate with the world around me. One feature I like about the new iSeries is the partner window. It allows people to see what I'm typing while looking at me. The device gives me back independence. I can continue life as if I am not living with ALS. So here you can that you could see that that was an example of a person who was very high level and using a Dynavox to communicate, you know, very fluidly. You almost didn't even realize that he wasn't talking. It's really an amazing thing. Here are some other um, examples of applications um, that you might see. These also could be seen on um, the paint scale that you see there. Also, might be on a piece of paper. Uh, at the top left, there's a simple yes-no app. You can download these on your iPhone, on your Android, uh, your iPad or tablet. Very simple to communicate basic wants and needs. Um, and on the right below that, you can see the paint scale. Um, it's important for someone to be able to simply explain how much pain or discomfort they're in. Uh, below that, you see the whiteboard, which you can use just to write out or draw a picture. In the center is the Vid Vita Talk. It's an easy app that's available in many languages and allows you to type or use pre-programmed common phrases. Lingraphica is an app that's both used for therapy, um, but also to, they also have simple communication apps um, in, their, in their realm as well. And then the speech assistant on the bottom right is a text-to-speech app, which is awesome for someone who 
can really type something out that they want to say and they can really communicate something more complex than using a simple board. So now we're going to talk a little bit about message banking. It's a little bit of a newer technology that some people haven't heard of. Heard of. It's mainly for people with progressive disorders who have the ability to lose their speaking um, but have not lost it yet. Um, you could have some difficulty with voice and some difficulty with speaking while working on message banking, but typically they have at least some ability to communicate in order to use this method. Um, what we're doing is trying to preserve the voice by recording messages and then they're organized, stored, downloaded, and these higher tech devices output the person's uh, voice instead of a programmed voice that is not yours. So we're going to show you an example of message banking now. All of these categories. So those are all the categories you did. One of these categories has anywhere from 2 to 10, 12, 15 messages that you recorded. I love you, Allie. <laughs> I love it! <laughs> I love you, Jimbo. <laughs> So, they're there. Um, can, you say, can you say another one? It's his name I want to say. I would like to eat a steak. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to ensure? <laughs> <laughs> so you could see there that a family um, was worked, two children were working with what appeared to be their father. Um, he had done message banking with a speech pathologist who recorded different phrases. They put them into his iPad, or you can again use those, that Toby Dynavox um, machine, and it gives the person's voice, it gives familiarity, it's just really something special to be able to do. So that's message banking. Um, we're going to move on to dysphagia now, which is disordered swallowing. So speech language pathologists evaluate a patient's swallow, which is often a difficulty that people with MSA have. Um, swallowing is, what it is, encompasses swallowing is the patient's ability to manage secretion, saliva, intake food and liquid. So what we would do is a bedside swallow evaluation, which sounds like you need to be in bed for it, which is incorrect, but you, you know, sometimes you're in an office, sometimes you're at the, you know, clinic. And what we do is we assess the swallow by giving an oral mechanism exam, looking at your mouth, looking at your face, seeing if there's any difficulties that could arise from that side. We would also give you food trials, ask you what you're having difficulty with as far as food. And then for therapy, we would prescribe a diet. You know, maybe you have trouble just chewing steak. Well, we would recommend that the steak be given a different form, maybe ground meat or something like that. And that can make all the difference. We also um, recommend strategies, exercises to maintain your swallowing strength. Um, there's something that we can provide called vital stim therapy, which is a higher tech, newer option. Um, what it is, is we attach functional electrical stimulation electrodes to your throat. It does not hurt. And it essentially strengthens the muscle, muscles of the throat so that you're able to swallow easier. And it has some long-term effects that can help with maintaining swallowing function. Um, one thing we also might do is refer for a modified barium swallow study, an MBSS, which is typically done at a hospital in a radiology suite. It's an x-ray of your swallow so we can see the anatomy a little bit better, see below basically what we're just seeing at, at your mouth when we see you face to face in the office, and we can see where the problem really lies and make some recommendations from there. And then additionally, we'll give you home recommendations and some strategies to continue at home to be eating safe during all meals. This next area of cognition we'll touch on pretty quickly. Um, most of it, it, you can tell just by looking at the slide. Um, a lot of times people with MSA do not have any deficits in cognition, but sometimes we do see it, especially as the disease progresses. Uh, 
want these areas that we may work with people on are executive functioning, organization skills, planning, attention, um, different parts of your memory, whether it be short-term memory, long-term memory, or working memory. Uh, we'll work with people on problem solving, judgment, decision making skills. Um, sometimes we work with people on safety. Uh, a lot of times they're doing things at home and they want to remain independent. So we really want to work with them on strategies and um, ways to help them maintain their independence as long as possible while remaining safe. Uh, a lot of times we'll work with people on sequencing, which is basically uh, putting things in order and doing things in the right order so that tasks can be completed efficiently and effectively. And then information processing, which is basically taking any, um, any information that we receive from our senses, taste, hear, smell, see, um, and using that information in our daily lives. So we're going to start wrapping up here and talk by talking a little bit about the plan of care and kind of explaining the, you know, going over the basic process that will, uh, um, you may notice if you have a speech language pathologist. So we basically assess the patient as we talked about in the beginning. We make any necessary referrals. So a lot of times we'll refer to a respiratory therapist, an occupational therapist, or a physical therapist. Um, sometimes speech is the first area that starts to decline for people with MSA. So you might notice your family member or yourself starting to have issues with your voice, a uh, little bit more difficulty breathing and getting that breath support and pressure that you need to really get your point across. So a lot of times we're the first ones to see um, some issues with fine motor or gross, gross motor coordination and we can make a, re a recommendation to um, the physician or the patient that they get a re uh, referral for physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, in terms of treatment, we are the ones who will develop a treatment plan, but we really take into account the individual patient's personal goals and what they really want to work on um, and maintain. So um, we'll, we'll usually make a recommendation for how frequent the speech therapy will occur and for how long it'll take place. Usually, um, you know, we'll see a patient anywhere from one to five times a week, depending on the setting. If they're in the hospital, we'll see them more often. If they're in a rehab, we'll see them more often at home for home home care, usually it's more like one or two times a week. Uh, and then we'll develop goals with the patient, the patient's goals in mind as well, and change those as the, um, as, you know, therapy goes on. Um, hopefully they'll meet some of the, those goals and we can make some higher level goals. And then we'll discharge the patient as appropriate. And we always recommend that, you know, once you're discharged, if things start to decline, just keep asking your doctor for another referral for, for speech, PT or OT, whatever it may be that you need. Um, so one of the last areas we're gonna talk about is what we do as speech pathologists for um, maintaining teamwork with the team um, of caregivers. Uh, we work with other therapists, again, those assistive tech professionals. It's important for us to work together to provide the best care for the patient. If we're all on the same page, we can help each other, we can know what's going on. It's really important um, for providing a home program. The caregivers can carry over our recommendations and can help maintain current abilities, which is really important. Some of those things that we give for a home program might be learning how to use your assistive device. We might give handouts with exercises for voice and swallowing. We might give tools such as an incentive spirometer to help with that respiratory support. Um, maybe the person needs an amplifier, their voice is really quiet, but they could simply use just a microphone to help their voice be louder. And we can make those recommendations. It really varies patient to patient, um, but there's a lot of things that can do to help quality of life and help communication, which is really so important. Um, we also participate in team meetings, you know, maybe it's over the phone, these days it would be over the phone, email conversations, um, things like that. So everyone on the team staying on the same page is so important for the patient and the family, and it's really great to work with other people and make sure it's the best for the patient. So here are some references. I have some websites up here. If any of those things sounded interesting to you, you could simply look at this website and look a little bit into it. 
deeper and further. However, again, all these things aren't appropriate for everyone. So it's really important to talk to your doctor, get a referral for speech therapy, and then the speech pathologist can really make clinical recommendations for you. Um, the main thing, the main point we want to get across is um, doctors are do a great job, but a lot of times they don't know about therapies and how they could help. So we really want to self-advocate for our patients and our loved ones and self-advocate for yourself. If you think you could benefit from speech or PT or really any service, um, never hesitate to ask your doctor because it could really make all the difference. Um, so we want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we hope everyone's healthy during this time. And we gave our emails here on the next slide. If you guys have any questions or you're interested in resources, you can feel free to email us. Um, they're here. And we're so glad you joined us today. Thank, Thank you. you.